okay, that's good. My name is Mark Altawil, and I will be hosting uh, this evening. Um, I'm a reader at UCL in the Institute of Archaeology. I'm an archaeologist of the ancient Near East and Mesopotamia or ancient Iraq specifically. I'm also a vice dean uh, at UCL. Uh, so I'm going to introduce the speakers today and uh, hopefully we'll have a nice discussion. Uh, I do want to just mention a few things uh, before we start. Uh, if you have questions uh, for any of the speakers, I think it'll be easier if you type the questions in the chat box and I'll be happy to uh, mention or read them to uh, read them out basically for our uh, speaker to address. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, introduce our first speaker um, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so our first speaker is Dr. Rojin Kamal Mohamed Amin. Uh, she's an architect and an academic with an interdisciplinary background and re uh, research interest in the confluence of digital technology, architecture, and cultural heritage. She holds a BSc in architectural engineering from the University of Steymani in the Kurdistan region of Iraq and a master's and PhD degrees in computational media design and environmental design from the University of Calgary in Canada. During her professional practice, she designed, co-designed and supervised numerous architectural and urban planning projects at the State Organization of Tourism, Ministry and Municip Municipality and Tourism and her own design studio. Since joining the Sleimani Polytechnic University in 2016, she teaches and supervises undergraduates and graduate students at the City Planning Engineering Department. She founded and directed SPU's Research Center for, uh, from 2016 uh, to 2018. She's also the founding head of the Digital Cultural Heritage Research Group at her university, which is the first interdisciplinary research group of its kind in Iraq. It's in this role, she has developed, raised funds for, and directed several projects in collaboration with local and international partners. Uh, Dr. Lujin, please uh, take it away and, and uh, we'd like to hear your talk. You need to unmute, sorry. <laughs> You're muted. So. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Dr. Mark. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone from whichever time zone you are joining us today. Uh, I would like to first uh, thank the organizers from the Nahri Network and the Chatham House, and especially Dr. Mehyar Khatam for all his uh, hard work uh, with putting this uh, webinar series together, uh, and also for his invitation. It is my pleasure to be here today and to talk about uh, the state of uh, cultural heritage in the Kurdistan region uh, and talk about also its uh, challenges, opportunities and policies. So let me just start sharing my screen. Uh, okay, so now everyone sees my screen. So it's uh, my screen is visible, just can you, okay. Okay, excellent, great, thank you. Uh, so similar to what uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, of the rest of Iraq has experienced uh, in the past few decades, the Kurdistan region uh, uh, of Iraq also experienced intentional and an intentional destruction and negligence of its cultural heritage, but with a different time frame and scale. So the cultural heritage sector within Kurdistan region has been really facing some uh, serious and key challenges that has been uh, hindering uh, its uh, proper development. So over the coming slides, I will be mentioning about some of those key challenges. And one of them is obviously conflict. So the region's cultural heritage has also suffered from subsequent conflicts and wars, and especially prior to 1991 and before the establishment of the Kurdistan region of Iraq, and also during the Anfal uh, campaigns and also Halabja genocide, which severely uh, 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 affected the, not only the tangible cultural heritage, but also intangible cultural heritage of Kurdistan region. Uh, another challenge that uh, the cultural heritage sector in general, and uh, in, including in Kurdistan region, uh, also uh, uh, experiences is actually weathering and aging. While weathering and aging, is actually not, not exclusive for Kurdistan region or even the rest of Iraq alone. However, its impacts uh, uh, further increases with the inactions of uh, with the inactions or slow protection measures like what often happen with in Kurdistan region and the rest of Iraq. So uh, as a result, many of the endangered buildings and uh, heritage uh, 
you know, uh, icons and artifacts and uh, legacies cannot endure or survive the lengthy and uh, bureaucratic steps involved with protecting this irreplaceable uh, tangible heritage. Then comes the very serious issue of uh, limited local heritage awareness, education, and engagement to a degree that's actually making it uh, very easy to uh, turn uh, valuable historic buildings into parking lots or having them turn into ruins or collapse in front of our eyes. Uh, and unfortunately, these disappointing pictures are becoming uh, an everyday reality for some of the historic buildings within Kurdistan uh, region. Now, uh, just speaking about this local, uh, limited local awareness about cultural heritage, actually, a couple of years ago when I came across this comic uh, and actually shared it in a conference, I thought it is one of the most hilarious depiction of the bitter reality of local, uh, of low local uh, heritage awareness and engagement with cultural heritage uh, in general and cultural heritage in institutions like museum in specific. And in fact, that it to some degree even applies to the rest of Iraq as well. And to give an idea to the non-Kurdish speakers among you, so this is basically a school teacher asking a, a student, what is Mozakhana? And Mozakhana is actually the Kurdish name for a uh, museum. So the student replies by saying uh, it's a place for selling banana. Uh, and of course, this is in a reference for the law uh, awareness about what is museum. And this is happening because the word Mozakhana, which is, like I said, the English, uh, the Kurdish word for museum, is because the word is composed of two words, Moz and Khana. Uh, Moza Khana, and Moz means uh, banana, and then Khana means a place. So, like I said, this has, this has, I thought this is kind of a hilarious way of depicting low local heritage uh, awareness. Yet, actually, last year, and during a large uh, field survey uh, by uh, my group, res uh, my research group members and volunteers, uh, uh, which was a, like a, a large field survey that we, we carried out with over uh, 700 locals uh, in the public places of Suleimani city. And this field survey was about uh, Suleimani museum visiting. And what, what they found out what, what now qualifies as an even, uh, as an even more uh, hilarious and, and disappointedly uh, version of the, this comic that I just show you, that's when, when they realized that actually Suleimani museum which is, the second large, which is the largest archaeology museum in Kurdistan region and the second uh, largest uh, uh, in Iraq in terms of collection was confused with Banzin Khana, uh, which means gas station in English. And that's again, this is just for this. It's not just the similarity of the name. It actually also uh, speaks for the a little awareness about uh, of some locals that they have about a very key uh, building they have within their city. And in that very same survey, uh, we found out that actually only 41% uh, of, uh, of the participants have been uh, into Suleimani Museum during any period of their life, like in any time of their life. And these were people like, you know, the, the survey was filled by predominantly, like they were predominantly people aging from 18 to 34. Now, a sub, uh, you know, uh, answers to a subsequent question actually revealed to us that even a lower percentage of that actually had any idea which building we are referring to. So we found out that only 33% could actually identify something, at least one thing that actually exists within Suleimani Museum. The rest were referring to things that doesn't even exist in Suleimani Museum, exist in other local museum or even other buildings within the city. That's just to give you an idea about, you know, uh, low local engagement uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, with a, 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 you know, a key building like a, a, a museum uh, within a city that's the second largest museum in Iraq and the uh, biggest uh, in, in Kurdistan region. Unfortunately, uh, the bitter reality of uh, low museum attendance also appeared in the local museum statistic themselves. And as you can see from, this is, a, you know, from this bar chart, this is just a comparison for, uh, you know, just showing the annual uh, visitor for 2017 actually between just comparing two uh, museums in UK one in a big size and then another one in a smaller size comparing it to Suleimani Museum which houses uh, some of the world class and actually very rare uh, 
uh, archaeological collections from early uh, human settlement all the way to more recent uh, periods of history. And as you can see, actually, I had to barely just draw myself the line, just, just that's how uh, the attendance for that museum is low by locals. And in fact, even that figure is actually the predominantly like, uh, like the people who are attending uh, Suleimani museums are school children, thanks to a, a, a school program that was uh, uh, developed by, uh, by the museum in collaboration uh, uh, with uh, an international partner, UNESCO at that time. So I mean, just that's again, is showing uh, that it's speaking for the slow attendance and you know a little heritage awareness and engagement with cultural heritage institutions. Now another actually big challenge is, which I would say is actually is the related to the narrow understanding of the bigger concept of cultural heritage and often confined within the uh, narrow scope of only built heritage and uh, tangible cultural heritage. I have noticed actually far too many local uh, think that when these historic buildings are demolished or collapsed, that then we, lo we lose all our, uh, we have lost all our heritage and identity. Well, of course, these buildings are uh, important material evidence from our past and definitely need to be protected. But I think that uh, confining and just de not only defining cultural heritage with only built heritage, with only buildings, materials, uh, is kind of a, a problematic. Uh, and to some extent actually takes away focus uh, from, the, from the protection of other forms of cultural heritage, including intangible cultural heritage. Then comes the uh, old museology practices, uh, and then which, which makes our museums are more object centers and actually less visitor centered, and then combined with too many other administration, uh, uh, practical, and logistical problem related to management and operation of these local museums. Another big challenge is actually related to a lack of a reliable and dedicated budget for these museums, which have been really hindering any efforts from the museums and uh, from the local museum actually to modernize. And you know, and in so this, in one hand they are underfunded by a regional government. And on the other hand, they have also these institutional challenges that doesn't allow them to generate uh, their own uh, revenue and also use it directly. So I will be mentioning that in the next slide. But I mean, just that's also another big challenge for cultural heritage sector that really hindering development of some of the key cultural heritage institutions. And within that organizational structure of uh, the existing ones for direct trade of antiquities and local museum, there are really serious problem in the way they are associated and the way they are structured within uh, the regional government. And that actually applies to also the bigger context of Iraq as well, in a sense that uh, these, uh, they don't, uh, these institutions, they don't have the flexibility or even the kind of independence that other uh, public museums have in other parts of the world in a way that they could uh, generate their own revenue and self-fund uh, some of their projects. So again, that's actually another big challenge for uh, cultural heritage uh, in some of the cultural uh, heritage institution within the region. Also limited number of museum experts and scholar. Uh, and that's again, not only in the context of Kurdistan region, but also actually it applies uh, to uh, across Iraq as well. And there are very obvious reasons for that. And that is their uh, lack of uh, dedicated museum programs and training at the local universities. The only time that actually you come across a, a, a course or any program that talks about museum is within an uh, archaeology department. And in Kurdistan region, as far as I'm aware, there are two archaeology departments where one of them, for example, in this case, in one of the curriculum, there is only one course that speaks about museum. And that's, of course, understandably because the the major is uh, archaeology is not museum, but I mean, that's the only time that uh, people with, uh, uh, you know, museum professionals uh, get exposed to museum training or at least any, any theoretical knowledge about museum. And this is actually an introductory course. Then, and, and you know, the, uh, the majority of the museum professionals within Kurdistan region are, are often with archaeology or architecture program. So if the case of archaeology is like that, in architecture, they even don't have any courses about museum. Unless you are someone like me who is an, archite an architecture student who like to do your own graduation project about museum. And that's the only training actually, you, the only time actually you, do, you get to do something about museum. And then now you are graduating, you get into a local museum. 
So that's uh, one of the challenges. But then the only, and the only, normally the only time actually these uh, museum, local museum professionals get training about museums actually through their, uh, through the interactions or even through the project, the individual project with international partners that they get some training about museology. Otherwise, like I said, it is, uh, it's really missing from uh, Iraqi university. Iraqi and Kurdistan regions university training. Like, I mean, there are no training provided about museum. And another big challenge uh, for cultural heritage sector is actually lack of informed policies and long-term planning. And I emphasize, I say informed, because sometimes even if they like, you know, even policies when developed for any sector, normally they are not as much as informed as they need to be. And within cultural heritage context, that need to be even uh, more emphasized. Uh, because, you know, without uh, policies and long term planning, uh, really that sector, which is often low, in, in lower prioritization, it's really difficult to, to plan and actually to have a, a comprehensive uh, uh, planning and also vision for uh, development of cultural heritage sector in Kurdistan region of Iraq. And the low prioritization of cultural heritage also appears in decisions about new development and construction. And this is actually often, so often cultural heritage often loses the case for new development and, con and uh, construction projects. And the latest headline actually on that is one of an example of how local cultural heritage is being, uh, is uh, more disadvantaged in comparison uh, to the uh, new development. And of course, this low prioritization uh, relates back to the other, some of the other challenges that I just mentioned about in terms of uh, little heritage awareness, organizational structure, and all, all these other challenges. Creating this vicious cycle for uh, challenges of cultural heritage uh, in Kurdistan region, uh, making it a kind of, to some extent, sometimes a stubborn actually uh, uh, vicious cycle that actually need to be broken for sustainable development uh, of cultural heritage sector in Kurdistan region. Now, is there any silver lining for all of this? Are there any opportunities? Yes, there has been, and there are still good opportunities for that sector. And one of them is actually related to cultural tourism and economy. So the economic crisis experienced by the region have been actually has turned to, has, has helped cultural heritage to, in some way, in a sense that uh, it has been encouraging local authorities and decision makers to think, or at least start to think about diversifying economy. And developing culture uh, like uh, tourism, including cultural tourism, uh, as a source for revenue, has been one of the topics that has been discussed uh, within the region and including by decision makers. And of course, this is helping in a long term for sustainable development of the sector. And then the inscription of Arbil Citadel as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2014. And the recent designation uh, of the city of Suleimani as a UNESCO creative city in literature which are actually opening new doors and opportunities for cultural heritage in Kurdistan region. And that's not only in terms of internal, internationalization, but also locally in terms of the opportunities, the connection, the collaboration, they are actually promising and also the new sources of funding they are attracting. And a, a new development and actually a, a good development and opportunity that has recently emerged again is the recent attempts to for drafting an archaeology and heritage management law in the Kurdistan region, which localizes Iraq's federal heritage law. And that has been uh, like, you know, a, a response for the really demands for, uh, you know, for heritage, uh, you know, uh, for you know, uh, informed heritage laws that are actually helping uh, the cultural heritage sector uh, development uh, and also promotion. And other uh, good opportunities have been uh, coming from the international support, uh, funds and collaboration from different countries and organization. So for example, our Nahrain network funded by AHRC's GCRF has been funding and supporting projects and scholars across Iraq, including uh, in Kurdistan region of Iraq. So, uh, and other examples include the Central Zakros project led, led by a team from University of Reading, the Erbil Plain Archaeological Survey from Harvard University, and another archaeology project in Duhog led by an Italian team, and many other archaeological projects across the region have been really contributing to the discovery of new knowledge 
not only about local cultural heritage, but also about humanity's history and these new findings and uh, you know uh, the knowledge in itself and also these evidence uh, are really uh, of uh, great importance not only uh, for local cultural heritage but also uh, for uh, hum for international community as well and uh, you know professional and scholars as well. And these projects also have been uh, really uh, helping and supporting cultural heritage uh, sector in Kurdistan region uh, through capacity building and also other ways. So, and some of these international uh, funds are actually going out of the archeological signs and moving more to the community. And some of these funds and teams have contributed to modernization of new uh, and also addition of new uh, engaging spaces in local museums. Uh, so for example, uh, the archaeological practice and heritage pro uh, protection project led, led by a team from University of Glasgow, an organization based in UK called INHERIT, have resulted in developing and opening the first uh, ever kids space in a local museum in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Uh, this and other uh, projects have greatly contributed to the modernization uh, uh, of uh, uh, you know, museum spaces and uh, in uh, Slemani Museum and also in Germian. And you can see from the pictures actually, these modernization are not only in the way uh, these uh, you know, spaces are designed or how things are displayed, but also how these spaces are interacted with and how the themes, the stories are told, which are kind of, that in itself is a revolution uh, in the museum space uh, in Kurdistan region of Iraq. Then a large project uh, funded by uh, a large project funded by the Nahri Network to our Digital Cultural Heritage Research Group, uh, based at the Research Center of Suleimani Polytechnic University, has helped us actually to establish a cultural heritage network for the Kurdistan region of Iraq in collaboration with our UK partners from the University of Reading and University of Leicester. So within one year of that project, actually we delivered. Uh, a total of uh, 24 uh, training workshops and seminars that are all related to cultural heritage and also targeting some of them were more knowledge, some of them were like training skills related to cultural heritage or even related to uh, raising funds for cultural heritage projects. Then we also organized uh, and co-organized six networking and community engagement in events. And actually the sight and sound of our events has uh, brought an, a total attendance of uh, over 4,000 attendants and from the three, like, you know, the three governorates of the Kurdistan region and of course, all the, all the other parts as well. And as part of our uh, cultural heritage network project, uh, we actually also uh, organized uh, uh, three focus group workshop for uh, data collection. Uh, and that involved uh, the, uh, decision makers and stakeholders uh, across different parts of Kurdistan region and uh, related to five research themes that we started about antiquities management in relation to Iraqi legislation and international convention, cultural tourism and creative industry, cultural heritage management during peace and conflict, cultural heritage education and research, as well as uh, cultural heritage digitalization in Kurdistan region of Iraq. So our goal with creating these events and actually this training and all these other activities has been uh, to connecting a local community to cultural heritage and actually connecting uh, the, uh, you know, the segregated uh, uh, community of cultural heritage, uh, uh, like scholars and professionals together as well. And since connection can motivate action, uh, we believe that these initiatives uh, can well contribute to local cultural heritage and help with its uh, sustainable development. And another good opportunity for a new engagement with cultural heritage anywhere in the world, including in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, is actually the fast paced and uh, ubiquitous uh, information and communication technologies. So the region's population, especially younger generation, is actually well connected to, con uh, to technology. And this also applies to the rest of Iraq. And as you can see from this report, this 2019 report uh, uh, about Iraq, uh, you know, there is a, there is a really high uh, number of uh, mobile subscription in Iraq. 
and near half of that actually uh, connected to internet and social media. And that's talking about mobile internet. So there are also these other people who are connected to Wi-Fi that are not, like I mean connected via Wi-Fi, but who are not included in this number. But I mean, so, so and, and for a region uh, that nearly half of uh, its population is below uh, 20 years old, uh, we believe that connecting to cultural heritage through digital technologies actually present new opportunities and engagement. And that's why realizing about this potential uh, for the last two years and, uh, and within our Nahrain collaboration and other uh, collaboration we have had with local and international partners, uh, our group has act undertaken and got involved with several digital cultural heritage projects and activities. Uh, and we are already really seeing big potential. So some of these projects, we actually, uh, you know, pilots of this project, we, we showcase it in some of our events, uh, but the, the, the majority are actually still underway. Uh, uh, because of time, I won't be able to get it into more details about our project, but, and this is not the focus of the, today's webinar, but just to give you an idea, we are continuing with these things. And like, you know, uh, as I mentioned, just about these opportunities. So I, at the beginning of the webinar, I talked about these different challenges and then about the opportunities. Now, how to weigh them? I mean, what, what is, the, what, I mean, if, if we compare and, and weigh in the opportunities versus the challenges, how this, how, how this looks like. So uh, from, from what, what appears actually in the landscape of uh, cultural heritage uh, of Kurdistan region, you know, uh, there are still, uh, you know, despite these opportunities and all these uh, potential, there are still uh, big uh, challenges and missing parts uh, that are really uh, needed to connect, to be able uh, to put uh, things together and actually uh, to uh, unify things. And uh, there are things that are still missing from the cultural heritage uh, ecosystem of the Kurdistan region of Iraq. And as I mentioned in the challenges, and I'm here mentioning it again, and that's actually one of the biggest one is informed policies and comprehensive long-term planning. And that's because even without that, uh, these opportunities are will be all individual projects that may not survive in long-term. But then when you have informed policies and comprehensive long-term planning, and then these, these things will bring, will like, just like an umbrella, will bring all these initiations and opportunities together and helps in the long-term and sustainable development of cultural heritage sector in Kurdistan region. Uh, in conclusions and overall, uh, the state of uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, in Kurdistan region of Iraq is more like in a thriving uh, stage, or at least we can say it is starting to thrive, especially after decades of struggles. However, just like what you see in this uh, thriving plant, it is still vulnerable and really need sustained efforts, continuous support, and inform long-term planning and vision to be able to survive and thrive. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to, again, thank the organizers and thank the individuals and websites that helped me with putting together some of the photos. Thank you. Thank you, Rojan. Very, very, very great presentation and, and very clear. Thank you so much for that. There were a few questions that came in. Uh, one of the questions is that in Sleimani, uh, I, I noticed my own experience going there uh, the museums often close on holidays, and, and this is a problem, of course, because if people are off, uh, not working, but the museum itself is closed, uh, how are we supposed to promote uh, heritage when you have this issue uh, where the museum, of course, is often closed on, on times and dates that people actually can, you know, have free, essentially, to go visit the museum? Yes. So, how do we address yeah. this? Basically? Actually, you see, I briefly touched on that. I didn't specifically mention that ours, but I mentioned about administrative challenges. And actually that ties back to the organizational structure. When you have a, a museum like uh, uh, in, in an organization structure that's listed as like any other government uh, department, then you end up with office hour, with hours that look like government working hours. And to be fair, uh, Sleimani Museum has been trying uh, to, to, you know, uh, to address some of that challenges by trying to open uh, in extended hours sometime, in, uh, sometime during the holiday. But this is just like has been more like a pilot, some a few days, not in a regular base that you have it forever, basically. No, still, like I said, uh, this and this ties back to the organizational structure problem, because like I said, museums are operating like a, any uh, government department. And so their opening hours is exactly the same opening hours as you have in any government department. 
Okay. And, uh, and kind of that's why I have been, and, and there are lots of actually museum people themselves are also calling for uh, for different ways of organizing, you know, structuring of museums and things like that. And, you know, because that will help them not only with generating revenue and also using it, but also on how they operate and even hire people and, you know, people yeah. working. And of course, one untapped area of thing that could be helping with museum, uh, you know, operation, extending museum operation time is actually using volunteers. You yeah. know, in Canada, for example, some of many of the museums are actually, actually supported by museum by volunteers who can help. But then, uh, when you open that, then if you go to the museum directors, they really have some serious uh, concern about security issues and you know people's background. In fact, I had a slide for the length. I, I cut it off. The the gate of the the interior gate of Slemani Museum is still a case, basically, yeah. like you are entering a case. Uh, so when I asked the museum director about why it's like that. He mentioned about too many practical reasons and security thing that made me oh yeah no you're absolutely right <laughs> so please keep it <laughs> yeah <that's important. laughs> good uh and related to this um are there any suggestions or action plans to sort of uh, increase citizens awareness in supporting and preserving cultural heritage we talked you talked about laws uh for instance about that improving laws uh to make protection of cultural heritage important but also awareness is obviously a critical thing particularly i've noticed this myself uh farmers oftentimes Sort of will excavate uh, an archaeological site and not report it to the antiquities authorities. So how do we improve uh, awareness uh, in this area? Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very good question, actually. You see, one of the things, in, 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 there is even theori theoretical discussion about it. The more you, you people understand about their cultural heritage, the more they, they want to protect it. So there is a really big, uh, and the more they value it, and the more they want to learn about it. So the more people understand and know about their cultural heritage, the more, the better you can protect cultural heritage. And to do that, some of the things that we already started within our research group and also I, I, we see other people are doing. So for example, uh, some of the events, the networking event actually we were doing, we were deliberately engaging things like, for example, inviting women who have been crafting things about uh, heritage things to be able to uh, showcase it while we have uh, people who are have, we were, we were having other events organized. So in these networking events, we were people, we were exposing people to uh, different parts of cultural heritage and they were interacting. And also uh, through some of our digital uh, cultural heritage project, we were also revealing history in very interesting and engaging way. Just one of the projects that we had was actually if you if you scan a, 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 one of those archival photos mm -hmm. from uh, uh, historical figures, they were starting to tell you stories from past. So this was was one of the engaging way. And another thing, actually, we had a, a simple wall where we were saying, "Can you share one of your memory with Suleimani?" And we, we noticed that how many people were engaged and how many interesting stories came out. So again, and then also within our actually seminars. So one of them was uh, delivered by Professor Roger Matthews and Dr. Wendy Matthews and uh, Dr. Amy. And what, what we found out, they were talking about the excavation that and the things that they have been finding in Bestansur and the stories that are coming out. And we were surprised by how many locals we didn't have any clue about the value of Bestansur and what are even they are doing. So I mean, those are interesting ways you can do through participation and community engagement that you could with cultural heritage, you could do a lot. Just to follow up, I mean, that, that's great with these uh, efforts. I, I'm wondering if, if there needs to be also a strategy that sort of addresses all the demographics. So for instance, Absolutely. Like young people, but also older people as well. And they might have different ways in which you communicate with them. Absolutely. You see, and that's why I have been emphasizing, you know, even in the challenges and even at the end of the opportunities, going back to that informed policies and strategies and vision, because without that, you know, these would be individual isolated efforts you could do improve something, but you cannot really guarantee their sustainability. And that's why you really need a longer, long-term planning uh, for that, for sure. Okay, great. Thank you so much, yeah, uh, Rojan. Yeah, well. Thank uh, you. I don't see any other follow-up questions. So uh, I think I'm going to move on to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Salahuddin Yassin Bapir. Um, and just to introduce our speaker, he is the head of the architecture department, uh, College of Engineering at University of Salahuddin in Erbil, uh, in the Kurdistan region, uh, in the Kurdish region of Iraq. Uh, he obtained his BSc in architecture from the University of Technology in Baghdad uh, with honors. Uh, he continued his MSc in architectural technology at the University of Technology in Iraq. 
um, in Baghdad. Um, and then he earned his PhD in theory of architecture in school of housing, uh, building and planning at UCM Malaysia. Um, he works as a consultant architect and designed several important projects in Erbil itself, uh, such as the supplementary buildings in the Erbil International Airport and Sami Abdurrahman uh, Park. Uh, Dr. Salahuddin, please take it away. Thank you. Oh, uh, you need to be un unmuted. Sorry. <laughs> You, you need to be unmuted, yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, if the screen is sharing, if you can see my screen. Yes, it's good. Okay, great. So let's start. This is, if you see this photo, you see that this is part of my city, which is the oldest settlement in the world. This is Errol City. Today, we will speak about one of my last articles which have been published uh, regarding the role of heritage buildings in constructing the continuity of architecture identity in a rural city. So, starting from this point, you see that this building, you will find that there's a continuity between the original citadel of the city and the down layers of the city, which is the continuity of but let's take a tour about all the commercial building right now in the city and to see what's going on. So normally in architecture, everyone's know that we have identity in two directions, which is preservation and destructions. The first refers to the stabilization forces, as we call it continuity, Whereas the second discontinuity is related to the uh, changing force. So the aim of this presentation is, uh, can be gathered in two points. The study was to measure the degree of continuity in commercial building des design in urban city, and then to study the influence of heritage buildings in constructing the continuity of architecture identity in urban city. So, if you take a look about this photo, this is at the city center of the herbal city. You will see the citadel, as I'm pointing by my house right now, and there is a very huge project. So there is, we can say, stabilization force, which related to the citadel, versus changing force with the commercial towers which have been erected recently. So as you see here, that we have such kind of forces. We can take a look about what is the continuity of one, the stabilization force or what's the changing force that changing everything. So I think this photo is quite clear to give us both approach that we have continuity the down and the backside, you will see a huge building, which is can be called the changing force. Okay. This is a part of our study with uh, explaining everything. So right now we will go directly to my case in Erbil City and concentrating on the commercial buildings inside my city. What's going on? Normally the architects and urban designers in developing countries trying to seize the issue of architecture identity to create a meaningful environment through two points. The first one, the first scenario is emphasize a locality or reflect an international trend. This is the both scenarios that uh, normally researchers and architects follow. So everyone knows that cultural heritage includes three points. Here, what you see in red, which is the buildings today that we are constructing on. So we have tangible culture, and intangible culture, and we have natural heritage. So our focus will be on the tangible one, which indicated by red, which is the buildings of the commercial buildings in Erbil Street. So basically this is, that's the base of our city. All every city started from the Vesta that the citadel was the city itself. After that, the city came down, some buildings came down and continued to be part of the main citadel of Herbal City. So if we take this photo right now, this is recently taken, 
you will see two sources, two direction, two forces. The original one, what we call the desire toward traditions. This is the original. At the back, there is the changing force. This normally happened everywhere in the world, but this is changing my city. So if we constructing here in urban city, you will see that as a result of the free economy, rapid changes in commercial street buildings become a visible phenomena which merge between the desire for traditions, what we call the separate of heritage, and the expression of new technology. This has led to a state of chaos of architecture appearance of commercial building and create various challenges in the architecture expression. It's interesting to note that in the last decades, architecture in urban city passed through rapid transformation due to the conflict tension between the desire towards globalization and conservation approach of the historical heritage. This is an example in my city that we have also the desire toward globalization. So we wanted to make a study between both issues to see what's going on. This is the new part of my city. And we can say clearly that very strong desire toward globalization even do not forget that Erbil City is one of the oldest settlements, not just in the area, maybe all around the world. So we make a study to collect all the commercial buildings in uh, 10 streets inside Erbil. In each street, we collect more than 12 cases to study all these cases and see what's going on. So this is the cases you see that we collected from all the, uh, the main streets of, from the city. Again, so here we are searching of something called continuity. The process of continuity in architecture related to the conservation approach, everyone knows that. This approach constrains the need to certify continuity by preserving existing signs. In the sequence formatting of identity relies to the idea of locality, aims to blind the culture, the climate, and the lifestyle together and use these as space for the urban form. There is a lot of definition for the continuity in architecture. I'll skip all of them right now, there's no need. But let's make a study of what we found, which kind of factors affecting the continuity. We find that there is two studies uh, maybe will benefit for us. The first one give us these factors, they classified in four directions, masses and articulation, openings, architecture details, and materials. While the second study constrained on spatial organization, semantic organization, and all the other factors that mentioned building materials relation with the context. All these factors, uh, if we just give a break to see how the city uh, uh, passed through. We have four categories of or four periods in our city. We have a break that we thought traditional pe period, which is before 1930. And we have colonial period, which is 30 to 80. Then we have from 80 to 2003, 2003 uh, relation of Iraq, from Saddam regime, and after that advanced modernity period. So the city passed through rapid transformation all around. This is this view of our city center. You see that the previously the city was the citadel, then expanded to be this zone, and then it's going on in the circles. And everyone knows that every city have a lot of circles. The last one that had just started applying is uh, 150 meters square, which is the last ring around the city. So our study take a lot of variables to see, to see what's going on. The first variable was the source of design of these buildings. The second one was the connectivity with architecture identity of the city. The third one was the design strategy of this building. 
The fourth one constraint on the type of change with the main source. Then this is our game here, the variable process of continuity, how we can make the continuity with uh, the original city. Then uh, we have another variable, which is the policy achievement uh, mechanism and connectivity with heritage through these variables. So the results indicate uh, we can see in the in term of sorts of design that we have we found 42 cases they are using modern approach we found 39 cases with mixed styles but we found that historical value from heritage only 26 cases which in a percentage of 21.7 this give us an indication what's going on and we should be aware and give instruction to the municipality what's going on, what's they doing, what's the regulation of the building in this historical city. So we found results indicates in our study that only 10 cases as an average of 8.33 have entire connectivity through one of the following measures, copying of the existing feature or from heritage or using similar vernacular architecture details. Other uh, parameters have been studied in detail. I don't want to explain everything, just want to show what's going on in order to see our conclusion at the end. Then we show the third parameter about the design strategies, how, how the designer uses it. A colonial results even indicated the most popular strategies is the using mix between both cases. And we see, let's just skip of this. This is the important part for us, process of continuity, how's going on. This is our fifth parameter. You see this parameter includes following values, connectivity by connectivity of units, continuity by elements, regularity, continuity by mass heights, and continuity by facade finishing material, and finally continuity by repetition of elements. All these, you see the most popular value in measuring this parameter that the study that only 33 cases as average of 27.5%. If we take a look here, you will see that the process of continuity, this is the type of continuity which have been done in 120 cases. We will find that we have 25 cases, they don't make any continuity and either just, just take a part or uh, an, an, a detail from the original source to be duplicated in uh, the design of uh, commercial buildings. This is the percentage of the process of continuity, the most constraining what in 27% connectivity by the, of the units as originally one. Then the uh, identity achievement mechanism this is the data that we get it and uh, connectivity with heritage. This is a core of our use. You will see in all these cases, we have only 26 cases that they have connectivity with our original heritage buildings. So in conclusion, what we get, what we have, what's going on. Despite theoretical claims, the heritage is one of the most important sources of architecture identity, which connects this man to his origin through the process of continuity. The research finding discovered that only 21.6 of commercial building in Erbil City is connected and dependent on the heritage buildings as source of design. Hence, Modernity as globalization force made several architecture forms within commercial streets in urban city. The generation of these forms is related to lack of spatial regulation of commercial building license in urban city uh, municipality. So the result clarified availability of two kinds of forces, as we explained previously, within commercial building design. This is the first approach is desired toward modernity, while the second one is negotiated towards tradition. It's interesting to know that the desire toward modernity is recorded in more cases than the second approach. 
Uh, so again, the results in, 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 the, in the research determine a dialectic relation between the desire toward modernity and belonging to the local tradition in commercial streets in Erbil city. Here, the finding of the study indicate that the heritage building visual elements and its architecture cues playing a tangible role in constructing architecture in the identity, especially in the buffer zone. Buffer zone of Erbil city, municipality building regulation within these zones affected positively the overall feature of the commercial building. If you just take a look about the buffer zones of Herbal City right now, we have special regulation for the buffer zone A, which is the nearest to the Herbal Citadel, and the buffer zone B. The building, even the commercial building in these two zones is more connected with our cultural heritage. So the continuity in architecture is related to the conservation approach. This approach constrains the need to clarify continuity by preserving existing sign in the sequence formation of identity relies on the idea of locality. It aims to bind the culture, the climate, and the lifestyles together. So then we have the buffer zone policies. I just put it to, for our colleagues, if someone or anyone wanted to know about the policies of buffer zone, we get a lot of benefits of, for this policy that we can control. Uh, these zones which is related to the citadel. I'm very happy and very uh, proud to say that the municipality in Herbal City, once they applied these regulations, uh, the city right now is really more uh, connected with the culture and these policies will help us in the near future to uh, take back to decide the, the city in two different zones. Maybe some zones we can give them the opportunity to use the modern uh, approach, but in the class circles to the citadel, I would like to thank uh, municipality once they put this regulation, which is related to the uh, zones clear to uh, citadel. Here, I should say, despite the Kurdish authority huge undertaking, we believe that much work is still to be done to ensure the preservation of the surviving the public of the citadel of, uh, as well as of the buffer zones and that involving private investor in the process to critical for the municipality. Thank you very much for listening to this short presentation. I'll be so happy if anyone have any question Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for UCL for sharing this uh, webinar for us. Thank you for all participants. I'm waiting if there's any questions. Thank you, Dr. Salah uh, There is a question that has come in. Um, yeah. uh, the question is, what is your role in these changes in urbanization process of their bill? Uh, do you sort of discuss with officials uh, when there's lack of knowledge of the heritage? And, or how do you sort of integrate, I guess, the management of the city um, mm -hmm. with your role effectively to sort of balance the ideas of heritage with the sort of economic needs. It seems like there's two forces, many forces going on, obviously. So how do you balance this? Yeah, actually, as you know, as we are in Department of Architecture, Salah Adin University, we have direct connection with the municipality, especially the Ministry of Municipalities. And we have continuous uh, seminars. We haven't started webinars yet with them, but we have continuous seminars so in these seminars, normally we was discussing, there is regulation there, but the regulation for the building license, it's not quite clear. They give chance for, for example, someone, if he want to make his commercial building, there is regulation, but the regulation is related to the height, setback, other issues, which kind of material to be used. Hence, once we apply the buffer zone regulation, we get a lot of benefits because there they define the material to be used, the highs, the details, all these. Details. If you take a look right now in the uh, close circles to the citadel, you'll see that there is a huge change between these buildings in the center, while if you go to the outside, which the different regulation from the for sure, in all the cities of the world, the same scenarios, you will see that the approach is going towards the modernization. 
No, thank you so much. Um, I thank just you. have a, a kind of related question. Do you find there's often a, a tension, I guess, uh, in, I mean, it, it seems like maybe if there's a better way to sort of uh, incorporate cultural heritage as part of the process, then perhaps there'll be less tension. So it's, it's something on the mind of regulators uh, from the beginning rather than sort of as just another step. They, so that way they don't see it as a, as a kind of hindrance, but rather as a, as a benefit for building a near bill or other places. Is there, is there some way to balance any tensions in, in, in terms of cultural heritage practice and building regulations? Unfortunately, no, but we're trying to find, we, we are in direct contact with them, at least to making uh, a lot of studies about this point. Uh, right now, I think we have, uh, uh, with UCL especially, with making uh, on cultural heritage on the rural areas, the identity of rural areas. I hope shortly we can cooperate with the, again, municipality or other sectors in the city to, to make more studies about these zones, these streets, these vistas. It's very, very hard to me to see some buildings which in, in terms of height is higher to the citadel and that was being established, uh, I think in 1970, because lack of regulation, lack of the uh, building license in that zones affected. So very hard to uh, demolish these buildings. But if we put uh, clear definitions for what we are trying to do in the uh, in cooperation with municipality, I think we can control and it's a good chance for our young architect to participate with us to make such communities and to see uh, how we can serve our city. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, Welcome. Uh, is there any other further questions? Uh, don't have any other questions coming in. So that looks like that is everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and Mihia, I don't know if there's any other issues we want to uh, discuss, but I think this is it for me. Um, and thank you both to our speakers, of course, Rojen and Salahaddin, uh, Dr. Rojen and Dr. Salahaddin. Thank you both for your time. Um, and thank you everyone else for coming and joining us today. Uh, I appreciate uh, all the efforts everyone's made to join us and of course uh, for our speakers in presenting this. Thank you so much.